Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rombel. I'm from Oros University and I'm going to present uh, our work on uh, digital assistance for quality assurance. Uh, it's a work by me and my colleagues, Andreas Fender, Thierry Furstner, and Kai Kronbach. So in this short video, uh, you can see our system in action. Uh, we provide um, co-located instructions for um, metrology procedures. And um, in our use case, uh, we are tracking a Lego brick. And the uh, Lego bricks are actually very challenging to track because they are uh, near symmetrical. So uh, I'm going to get to that soon. Um, what is applied metrology? So in our use case, applied metrology uh, is the activity of measuring objects for quality assurance in industry. So in this uh, use case, a very high precision is required. Uh, and uh, although uh, many of these procedures are performed automatically, there are still a lot of them that have to be performed manually by workers. And uh, our application case is a quality, quality assurance at the Lego company. So it's uh, the toy manufacturer uh, in, uh, in Denmark. Um, and um, the Lego QA metrologists have to basically follow these instructions in a PDF. Um, take um, the measurements and input those measurements in a database right now. So it's, it's still a very conventional setup, and um, um, it's a challenging task for them because they have to be uh, measured in predefined points and in a predefined order. So it means that the brick orientation is actually very important to assure that these measurements go in the right place in the database. So the main goal of our uh, assistant is to uh, replace these PDF instructions and the manual insertion with step-by-step uh, -step co-located instructions and uh, automatic database entries. So our digital assistance, uh, assistant has two modes that we call co-located mode and uh, handheld mode. And uh, the co-located mode is what you see on the left. So basically we give um, is, um, uh, situated instructions on the left side of, this, of a, a screen on the surface, but we also give instructions on the brick itself. So uh, this is our default mode in our system. We, we, we use this mode uh, every time it is possible. However, for some uh, reasons, uh, so for example, the brick is being handheld or the brick is partially occluded, it's not possible to track the brick on the screen anymore. So in this case, we fall back to our handheld, what we call handheld mode, which we, where we basically display a situated guide, which is uh, the guide on the left. And as you can see, we still show the brick in the same exact pose as it is being handheld. And uh, we are going to get into how we do that very soon. Um, but basically, uh, this um, digital assistant um, has a several, adva uh, several adva advantages for the worker due to the co-located and, si and situated instructions. So to begin with, since it is a visually less intensive task, um, the worker doesn't have to look for the very tiny features anymore to disambiguate the brick orientation or the object orientation. So it causes less eye strain. Then uh, there is no need for me to perform mental rotations anymore. So according to related literature, this would also re result in reduced cognitive load. And finally, there is the potential for fewer mistakes because since now um, the measurements are going into the da database entry that corresponds to the uh, to the current measurement, uh, there is uh, obviously the potential to uh, have uh, fewer mistakes. This would have to be verified through a user study, but this is our initial assumption. So uh, to track the, our uh, objects, we developed an approach that we call focus plus context tracking. It's inspired by the work of Baldich and others on focus plus context screens. And um, in um, our setup, it's basically a multi-camera setup where we have what we call context cameras and focus camera. And uh, basically the, the task of the context camera is to provide an overview of the whole working surface, while the focus camera is to provide a high resolution p uh, picture of uh, the object of interest. So basically in, in our use case, uh, the context cameras tell the focus camera where it has to look in, uh, in, the, in the surface. And now Andreas will give you some details on the tracking pipeline. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the overall pipeline, so the hardware and software components and how they relate to each other and communicate with, with each other. So let's start with the hardware components. So these are the components uh, we use in a very abstracted uh, depiction. So of, co of course we have a PC, and then we have these two webcams, and we have a horizontal display. We have the DSLR uh, camera, 
a Pantle unit and a Raspberry Pi. And here's how they communicate. So first, the webcams are streaming. They're like kind of wide field of view um, footage to the main uh, PC. And then that PC is communicating with the Raspberry Pi via HTTP. And the Raspberry Pi is then in turn controlling the Pantle unit to uh, rotate the DSLR towards uh, the brick, um, which like, and that information is of course provided by the webcams. And, um, and then in the end, uh, that DSLR is taking pictures and they are at a very high resolution and these are then transmitted back to the PC. And in the end, we can then finally render uh, the instructions on the horizontal display. And so the overall data flow is uh, controlled by uh, the world framework, uh, which I presented last year at ISS. Um, and so here, is, here are the modules that we have, or here are like the, the software modules that we uh, implemented. And then based on that, we implemented various different uh, variations of our pipeline. So we started out with a uh, very basic um, using homography and 2D tracking to track the brick. And then we do something in deep learning, which is uh, called classification, which is what Joao is gonna talk about later on in much more detail. Uh, and so later on, we moved on to other uh, more deep learning um, focused approaches where we do instance segmentation, again, details later, and then use regression to get the orientation. And, um, and another variant that we uh, used in the very end, which is like our main approach, is to first do instant segmentation, then get the orientation of the brick in, in an ambiguous way. Um, and then we use classification to, to break up the new symmetry of the brick. <clears throat> All right, so now I'm gonna talk about that variation of the pipeline. Uh, so first, we're gonna find the, the brick based on the footage of the, ca uh, of the webcams. So um, just on a very high level right now, so we're gonna find the brick in the two pictures and then know, uh, knowing the intrinsics and ex extrinsics of the camera, we just do some basic line intersection to then know where the brick is in 3D space. And then we use that in information to control our um, pantled unit. So the, the camera is then rotated towards the brick and the involved comp components here are of course the camera, the pantled unit, an accelerometer to know how it's oriented right now uh, for the whole like feedback loop and a Raspberry Pi. And so that's sort of um, the quality of the picture that we get from the camera. It's maybe a little bit hard to see on the projector right now. Um, yeah, but that's how it looks like. And what we can do with that picture is we can, um, knowing that it's almost orthographic because it's zoomed in, you can see already that there is no like perspective distortion or something. It's like zoomed in really far so we can assume that there's no perspective, almost orthographic. And that means that we can just use that long edge, um, a very simple way to get the ambiguous orientation. And again, ambiguous means if we rotate that one uh, 180 degrees, then of course we will get the same edge and we would get the same orientation. Um, but that ambiguous orientation is then uh, later on used. But before that, we do the classification. Again, a little bit more of like theory behind is gonna follow up later on. Right now I'm only saying what is actually happening. So what we do in the next step is we look um, to the logo of the brick. Um, again, we have very high resolution, so we can actually see the logo. I'm not sure whether the back rows can see it on the projector, but it's visible. And in these two examples, it has like two different orientations, and that's gonna help us to disambiguate um, between these two orientations. And so in the very end, we have all the data necessary. So we have our input, we get the longest edge to get the ambiguous uh, orientation. Then we combine that with the uh, classification of the logo, um, where we classify between four different uh, orientations. And in the end, um, to disambiguate between the orange and blue vector on the left, uh, we use the, the green vector, the classification on the right, and then the one with the positive dot product is gonna be the resulting vector, which is like in the lower part, um, the blue vector. All right, so to quickly summarize that part, so first we do instant segmentation to get uh, where the brick is in 3D space. Uh, next, we're gonna uh, track where um, the orientation by looking at the longest edge. And in the end, we do classification and disambiguation. 
And now in the, in the remainder of the presentation, uh, Joao is going to talk about the deep learning uh, modules. Yeah, so uh, our, uh, as Andrea said, I'm going to start, I'm going to start with um, um, instance segmentation, which is part of the pipeline where we do, when we call, where we call the handheld mode. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, here we are. Um, and this is some uh, uh, footage of our instance segmentation model. As you can see, it runs in real time, and um, it's very robust to occlusion. Um, so for, to, to train this model, so this, this is a deep learning framework by he and others. It's Maskar CNN. And uh, we were able to train uh, this model using a very um, small data set. So we used uh, transfer learning on the COCO data set, and we, we were able to obtain uh, higher uh, high accuracy uh, with a data set as small as 90 annotated images. So this is also very relevant because it means that to um, develop our approach for a new object, one doesn't have to train with uh, uh, extensive amounts of data. So uh, a, comparison, a quick comparison between uh, our instance segmentation mode and uh, our, uh, other, the conventional computer vision techniques. So uh, as I said before, it's robust to partial occlusion. Um, it runs in real time, even though it still requires much more computational power. Um, and of course, this can run not only on the screen, which is also um, some, something that is very important uh, for, for the handheld mode in, in, in this case. So uh, now I'm going to talk about the orientation models, which are the, the ones that uh, basically perform the disambiguation or get the exact orientation. Uh, I'm going to get to that very soon. Uh, in our in our pipeline, so we also uh, for these ones we use um, a very straightforward 50 layer residual network, uh, and we are here in our pipeline. So uh, in our classification approach, we call it classification approach. I, I'm also going to get there soon, uh, we treat, because we treat the problem from a classification perspective. So we basically assign classes to angle intervals. So for example, as you can see on the picture on the right, um, these. Lego logo would be assigned to a class that is on the right because it, it, it's the most similar orientation that, that, that we, we can uh, find. Uh, and the main difference between both approaches is that in the classification approach, we predict a class, basically, and uh, while in the regression approach, we predict the exact orientation of the, of the, the, the element. So the main difference in the architecture is that we, have, um, a, we use a cross-entropy loss, loss function for the classification approach, while we use mean squared error loss function for the regression approach. So the main differences, uh, our, our findings and the main differences between both are that uh, we, we always achieved higher approach, uh, higher accuracy in our uh, classification approach. Um, uh, one other nice, nice thing in this approach is that it doesn't require the exact ground truth, so it doesn't require the exact orientation of the brick. Um, however, it doesn't work on round objects. So for that, this was also one of the motivations to develop an, uh, a different approach. So the, the, uh, when um, treating the problem as, as a, as a regression, uh, from a regression perspective, uh, it works on any object. And we don't really need to disambiguate anymore, uh, which is very nice when um, that, is, uh, that is not possible. Uh, uh, and, um, well, uh, the, the, the biggest drawback is, it, is that it achieves, achieves slightly low, lower accuracy, but it's only 10% less accurate on average, which is not too bad. So the key takeaways, like from our technical evaluation, were that using transfer learning um, always resulted in higher accuracy and faster training. So this was uh, an expected result according to related literature. Um, augmenting the, uh, the, uh, our data set with random um, rotation um, gave always a very good accuracy boost, especially when the data set was small. So this also allowed us to train uh, our models with very, very small data set sizes, such as 50 samples, and achieve, still achieve very uh, high accuracies. So for example, with 50 samples, we can achieve 91% accuracy, and uh, um, with 100, we, we were able to achieve 90, 98. Um, finally, we are, as I also uh, explained before, solving the problem from a classification perspective always resulted in higher accuracy than solving it from a regression perspective, which actually opens very interesting new research directions. Um, and to conclude, we proposed a, a two-step approach for post-estimation uh, that we call focus plus context tracking. Uh, we described our tracking pipeline and uh, um, explored and evaluated different approaches and uh, demonstrated that our approach was applied in a typical metrology scenario. So, yeah, 
Um, thanks for listening, and if you want to reach us, you have our email, and uh, yeah, time for questions. Thank you. Thank you. If we have any questions. Hi, thank you for the great talk. I'm Thibaut from Grenoble, France. So uh, I'm a little bit uh, concerned by the overall latency of your system, uh, including the um, speed of the rotational thing of the high resolution camera. So my question is uh, maybe what is the overall latency and um, what is the resolution that you need for from the um, high resolution camera because uh, you mm -hmm. rotate here to have a maximum resolution on your model mm -hmm. uh, but if you need less resolution maybe you can have a, maybe a, you don't need to move it a lot so do you need a high resolution uh, did you investigate how uh, with smaller resolution it affects the results in the end um. So th that's a very good question. So regarding the latency issues, um, our current uh, uh, hardware setup uh, has quite a lot of latency actually, but that was also because of the hardware decisions we made in the beginning of our uh, prototype prototyping. So uh, we've, we, we have seen some other uh, alternatives. So for example, our pen tilt unit can sometimes take one second, two seconds, like and taking the picture, like the whole, the whole thing can take up to one second or two sometimes. And, uh, but this could be, could be easily solved if we, have, uh, if we, if we try out um, higher, uh, the, some industrial grade cameras and uh, maybe a faster uh, Jimbe instead of the pen tilt unit. So those, those are limitations that I think it could be overcome. Or also, there's also always a possibility to use multiple zoomed in cameras and just with our context cameras tell which one we should uh, look into right so th that that's a very interesting uh, a very interesting question and I, I think there could be future work to um, improve these latency issues um, then re regarding your second question about the resolution uh, we did not try um, many different settings so we we did some initial uh, testing uh, about, uh, for how zoomed in our uh, picture would have to be but uh, we, we, at least it uh, for uh, it, it, the logo needs to be visible to the human eye, so uh, for uh, it, it, for it to in our initial experiments to get, give uh, uh, some accurate um, results. So I would say you, you still need uh, very high accuracy, but I, we did not explore uh, how high that needs to be. That could be also future work. To quickly follow up on the on the first question, so also the reason why um, initially we didn't really prioritize latency because it's not really like kind of like a play AR context where you move around the brick a lot and it always has to be co-located. Like the and the use case is more like all right, here's the brick. Where do you need to measure? And now you have the information, and then it doesn't need to like in that use case, like really in that use case, just uh, it doesn't need to be always co-located. So like you just need that initial information. And then, and then that's it. And then, when you go to the next step, then that's um, then it doesn't take too long to get the next uh, instruction. So on that time scale, it's actually not that much of a latency. But of course, um, obviously, with like different hardware, we can easily improve it to then make it also applicable to other use cases where latency is a lot more um, uh, has a lot higher priority. Um, yeah. Thank you. Hi, uh, Patrick Rapschläger from the Interactive Media of Dresden. Interesting work. Um, does it work for uh, bricks with have a different shapes? Maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. And uh, do you have any strategies um, on bricks that don't have the Lego logo at all? Okay, so it, it doesn't. It's not limited to the Lego logo. It can be any features. Uh, in this case, in our case, it, and in, with this brick, it was the Lego logo. So if you read our paper, we have actually some other object there just to, as a proof of concept. But um, like these models are very generalizable. So if you check re uh, related literature, like using deep learning solves a lot of different tasks. So I, I, I don't think that will be a problem. Um, but um, um, yeah, that, 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 I think that, that answers your question, right? 
So I also have one question. So you use the transfer learning for uh, with the 19 annotated samples. So that accuracy is from how many validation samples? Uh, sorry. Okay. So uh, you use the Coco data set, yes. and then you apply the transfer learning with the 90 annotated samples. Oh, yeah. Uh, in so our, yeah. The, yeah. how many samples did you use for the validation? Uh, in, in our use case, we used 30 samples, but so yeah. That was previously seen to the network or that was unseen? Sorry? It was unseen to yes, the network? Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So any other questions? Hello, uh, Adili from University of Sussex. And would you explain um, or uh, briefly explain how you justify that the view is orthographic? Um, can you elaborate a bit on, on the question? Like the like view, uh, the view of the the model, the Lego. You said it is orthographic. How do um, you justify that it, it is orthographic uh, view? Um, so in general, like in, in many camera systems, um, like many things are approximated as an orthographic uh, projection to just simplify things, and we're basically doing doing the same here. And especially in our case, it's like really like zoomed in a lot, so there isn't a lot of perspective distortion to really change, um, to really distort the orientation that we that we track. If the, if that's what you mean. Uh, have you ever tried like draw a line from uh, if you show me the the Lego picture again, oh, image. Not, oh, sorry. sorry, I thought oh, it was already. Oh, it's okay. If you draw lines, yeah. If you look at the bottom, if you draw uh, the line, uh, two lines at the bottom, you draw one line at the top, isn't it? Now, if you draw lines at the top, does the line will converge at some point? Um, at, have you ever at, tried that? At a very far away. Point yes, uh, it will, but that's why it's almost orthographic. Um, so it will, it's still perspective, but it, it just um, it converges in a very far away distance. Okay. Um, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let's thank our speaker once again. So the next talk will be.